Sister Jeannie Wilkerson, a recognized authority on intercessory prayer, has more than 30 years of Bible teaching experience. Sister Jeannie ministers God's Word in the free flow of His Spirit with anointed preaching and ministry. Now, let's enjoy the message from Sister Jeannie Wilkerson. Um, Give you just a little rundown on time. How do you know time? How do you know where you are in time? Because God reckons time. He's marked it off identically. And you know exactly if you know how to reckon time where we are in time. Many people do not know. Therefore, because of this fact, many today are living in unbelief. If you do not believe and understand where you are in time, you're liable to miss some things. Did you know that? You're going to miss some things. So I'm going to show you the difference in time and tell you which is which. Now you're going to have to get this. You're going to have to think as we move into this for a moment because this is a little bit something that you have to deal with. There are two distinct systems of Reckoning of time, two distinct ones. The two are chronological and decreed systems of time. Chronological and decreed. There's a difference. Chronological time is where there's just a sequence of events like days, nights, years, months, and you know exactly what's coming. That's chronological time and you can uh, date and compute things by chronological time. But there is also decreed timings. Now, I'm not going into all that there is on me. I'm just going to give you a background. Decreed times are like this. If you'll go to Daniel for a moment in the ninth chapter, I'll show you just a little bit of decreed timing. God has decreed certain events to happen at a given time. And these are measured. Daniel 9 will be one of them. In the uh, 22nd verse, Gabriel, the angel, angelic visitor, has come to talk with this man, Daniel. Do you know why he had such visitations? Because he was such a man of prayer. He was such a man who was so intimate with his God, knew him so well that he was called three times in the Scriptures, Beloved of the Lord. Beloved of the Lord. Because he was such a man of prayer. Do you know that you can only come to know the heart of God no other way is when you move in close to Him in the intimacy of prayer. There it is that you hear God's heartbeat. You hear His voice. You come to know it. It becomes real to you. It's life. More than life to you. You must hear it. So this man knew it like no other man of his time knew the voice of our God. And in this, because of this, he had great visitations, the two worlds. You see, the world, which is God, spirit life, we call it. And in going along, I'll kind of define things a little bit for you so I won't lose you. When we think of spirit life, we think of life, oh, that's ethereal, we can't get our hands on it, it isn't concrete, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, almost sometimes we think of it as kind of spooky. Not so. The spirit life which exists and has always been there is the most concrete, the most real, the most um, powerful, the most unlimited, the highest kind of existence. That's what I speak of when I speak of spirit. So when you come to know this realm, and you see it has such inner working, such power, and it moves into this realm occasionally, and men of God who are men truly living after the Spirit will be able to see the invisible, though it's not 
there, we cannot see it with a natural eye because of sin. Sin set up a roadblock so that we can no longer, there was a day when that was no problem. We could see in, when walked in this realm as much as we walk in this one today. We could see it with our natural eyes before sin came in. Sin created a sound barrier, a sight barrier. You can't see God with your natural eyes, neither can you hear Him with your natural ears. So now the Spirit of God has again returned to those of us who know Him, and He has given us the high-frequency capability of picking up again out of that realm which God is. See? The barriers removed. The sight barrier, the sound barrier, the audio-video powers of God are there. Vision and hearing. And when you get the double, the two, you see it and you hear it, that's double emphasis. That means it's very important and it's going to come to pass very quickly. When you hear and you see. Vision and hearing. Audio, video power. God said to me, he laughed at me one day because I always laughed at people who said they had vision. <laughs> I used to. And he backed me in a corner during the years that I was in intercession and he began to give me vision. <laughs> he said, my dear, how ignorant can you be? <laughs> ignorant? Yes. You see, ignorance is what breeds our fear. If we actually knew our God, we would never fear. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's like I tell them many times, I can sit in my home at night, and when it's darkness all around outside, and all of a sudden I hear a noise out there. You know what? The first thing I think of, what was that? Yeah, I don't know. Fear of the unknown. You see, the unknown, what you do not know, breeds fear. But if you really come to know your God, you will not fear. <laughs> so this is why I wanted to, just for a moment, just show you that the power of that life which he is, you see, he wants to invade time with this. He wants men who are time-oriented to realize that God wants to invade your little world and enlarge your vision, your video power. For you see, if you can take what's going on around the world today and pick it up by satellite and relay it into your front room, God said, where do you think men got this? He said, they've been 6,000 years catching up with what I've known all the time. Poor thing. <laughs> we think we're so brilliant. God's known it all the time. He said, they just now caught up a little. And he said, this is the only age, this century, that could even begin to understand the moving of that life which is spirit. It's the fastest moving life in the world. It is chronodia, it is nuridia, it moves faster than the sound of light. I mean the sound and the speed of light. That's the reason in the end time, there were 25 prophecies fulfilled in 24 hours. That's right. <laughs> this is what the speaker is saying. <laughs> He's speaking, helping me here. <laughs> so you see, time is very, very important. And to know where you are, very important. I, I just love to teach on it all. So beautiful. God has so harmonized it. He told us in the beginning, six days you'll have to labor, and that's all. Just six, and no more. So in Daniel, we'll go into this. I think I've laid you a background to let you understand a little of what life is, what spirit life is like. <laughs> Instead of oh, being grounded, earth hole, ground hole. 
we're so grounded we can't move out of this. You know, I tell you, when you get into worship, especially that it's the new day of restoration, my dear me, my spirit wants to go. <laughs> I want to get going. But you see, I'm grounded yet. You know why you ground in things in your house? So that it won't get burned up, burned out. My body is not yet glorified. I couldn't stand that power in all of its own. When I finally get the glorified one to match my spirit, I'm going to travel. Hallelujah. Woo -hoo. Woo, glory. <laughs> You're going to travel. You ought to talk me, Messiah. You ought to teach your people sometime about the body in its amplified powers and glorification. My dear me. Woo, woo, God. Somebody poor things. You know, we, we put out such things to people today. And we, you know, I went in to teach a class in uh, Victory recently and bless their hearts. They were just crying and saying, Miss Wilkerson, we've been told that if we don't voice our prayers, God doesn't hear us. I said, too bad. Who told you that? I said, he picks up the slightest rustle of a leaf. What do you mean to tell me that if you do not voice this, you does not do it? I said, I can tear that so much to pieces that you'll have to throw all that out. <laughs> That's not true. And yet we're telling people things today and putting, and we talk about, we're bringing them out of bondage. We're actually putting them in it. <laughs> That's the truth. Terrible. Bless them. You don't rest when you're in bondage to certain things. They were so disturbed and they were so broken and they were so fearful that if they did not voice things, that they weren't going to be heard. Baloney. Why, I've even been awakened in the night. And you know what I would be hearing? I would be hearing the spirit. You see, the spirit of you never slumbers nor sleeps. He doesn't need rest because he doesn't tire. But your body, because of sin, has to be refreshed. And your body can be sleeping. But your spirit is working on through the night season, even while you sleep. If your spirit is exercised in the daytime, so I had been in intercession all those years and I would be awakened in the night and I would be hearing a voice within me just praying away like a recording and I wasn't saying a word out there. And you know why the Spirit was praying and why he awakened me? Because when I was awakened fully and I'd for a long time I'd just been laying there listening to this, suddenly he opened my eyes to see that there was something there that would have attacked me. But he being aware of this and working on through the night season in the cover of darkness, immediately when I awakened and he let me see this, that force vanished. Hallelujah. You see, your spirit is on guard continuously. If you... Keep it exercised during the day. But if you don't, you won't have it. So you'll be spared many things. So I want to show you then about decreed time here. In the 22nd verse, and it says, And Gabriel informed me. Ha ha, you need information, don't you? <laughs> Where do you get information from the battle lines in the natural, from headquarters, from the high command? So he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show you some things. For thou art greatly beloved of your God. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. 
70 weeks are determined. This is the determined time of God. You see, this has to do with Israel. And Israel is your timepiece. Time is never reckoned of, with the church. Time is reckoned always with Israel. When Israel was out of the land, out of fellowship, time did not count. When Israel came back and was reinstated as a nation, time began, oh, of course time was going on chronologically, but I'm talking about determined time. The decrees and the determined times of God for certain things to come into being. Then it was that the time clock began to start again. Do you know how this operates? Do you know how long it would actually take to play a football game if you went straight through without being time being called? One hour. It takes three hours the other way. So you see, when they're off of the field and they're off of the court, time stops. It isn't being counted. So when Israel came back into the homeland, back years ago, back really in 1917, the time clock began to kick, kick away again. So these are the decreed timings of God. And when God decrees a thing and says at that time, it will happen, it will happen. Hallelujah. The determined times of God, God said to me one time, uh, about Jesus. He said, when I spoke the word of three, Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would come and bruise the serpent's head, he said that was as good as done as the 4,000 years when he finally arrived. But he said, they should have known when I would arrive because I told them all through the Old Testament what day the lamb would be offered on. What day was it? How long were they to keep a lamb up before it could be sacrificed? Four days. <laughs> and a day with God is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So that's the reason. You see, with God, Jesus, it was just four days until he would arrive. But with us, it was just 4,000 years. So he told them, he decreed it. He said, look for him. He will arrive at the end of 4,000 years. And he did, didn't he? Exactly on the day that Daniel said he will arrive. He said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And then he went on to tell them, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And you know that turned out to be seven hundred and eighty-six thousand some odd days and at that particular day he arrived in Jerusalem in the great triumphal entry. That's your decreed timing of God. So we're living in the decreed timings of God now. No two ways about it. We are there. And this is why it's so important. So I'm going in now I wanted to show you the two time differences in time for you. See, I'll give you an example about decreed time. Suppose a man was sentenced for a crime to 10 years in prison. At the end of 10 years, he escaped. I mean, five years, he escapes. That doesn't mean his prison sentence is not 10 years. For in, uh, after much hunting for him, he is caught. They bring him back into the prison to finish out the decreed time. So it was with Israel. God had decreed a certain number of years. 
that they would be out of the land. At that time, then he said, they will be apprehended of God, brought back into the land, and from then on, they'll finish out the time I have decreed for them. Hallelujah. And I wish I had time this morning to tell you why Jesus didn't finish the 40-year period of his life. 40 was the number determined on Israel. He should have lived 40 years. Gone on, but he only lived 33, and he's got seven years of time left. Ha <laughs> ha! You work that one out. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Give you something to think about this afternoon. <laughs> so I'm going in then to with you. The reason you see that people today are not moving into God because though they've heard these things, they don't believe it. We're there. He said, this is the generation that is going to see the return of Jesus. Times are decreed for this. Hallelujah. This generation is the generation that's going to see the return of the Christ. And you can't come back to a place you've never been. Hallelujah. I often tell them, my, isn't it quite a paradox we talk about a man who lived before he was born. Hallelujah. Jesus. He lived before he was born. And let me tell you this. In coming down into time... Making his descent, he had to condescend, he had to descend out of the heights into the depths because as God, he had to undergo a change before he could enter into time. He had to undergo a birth, a new birth. Same thing, see. What God did, we do. He descended, we have to ask him. Back into the heights as a son of God. Hallelujah. Read the faith. You speak a month, please? See? Yeah. Hallelujah. He came into time. And the reason that he came as a man was because had he come as God, every one of us in sin would have been annihilated. In mercy, he covered himself with flesh. We couldn't have looked on him. That life which is spirit is so fiery, so powerful, so anita, so full of vitality, energy, that it will destroy anything that's not of its nature. Marisha. So don't think you're going to pass the censorship unless you are fully filled with this divine nature. For well, that fire which it speaks of that he is, is constantly censoring everything that is not of its nature. So, in the 17th of Luke, we're going back to, <laughs> in the 26th verse, <clears throat> and as it was, I'm just laying you a background here because that's not where I'm going to stop today. In the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until life was going on as usual. We're looking for trumpet blasts and all this kind of thing. Not at all. Life is going to be moving right on, but they're going to be like uh, the spiritual and the natural are going to be like two skis in a race. Hallelujah. We're moving right through this natural world, but we're moving with God. Therefore, this race is going to cause they are fear. This man who is moving in God in the spirit is going to not even be touched by all of it. <laughs> Why do you worry about this? This is the signal to get on your mount and get going. 
grace is on. <laughs> so he said, they did eat, they drank, they married, gave in marriage, and so Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, he said, same way. Also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold. Did you ever see a day of buying and selling like it is today? Today, somebody owns a business, tomorrow you go and somebody else has it. What's the matter with you? Wake up! <laughs> They're here. Buying, selling. Do you know that in the days of um, the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, when it says there were giants in the earth in those days, do you know what that, if you would trace that, do you know what it actually means? It meant that it was a day of giant conglomerate that swallowed up the little man. That's exactly what it meant. Hallelujah. Do we see this today? You see what Satan is working toward? He's trying to get a stranglehold on free enterprise. He doesn't want anybody free. Business, individuals, churches, nobody. Then it's our fault. If we allow this giant conglomerate to nominee to swallow us up. Hallelujah. We forget that he doesn't even want free enterprise. And thank God today we heard Billy Graham is starting in Washington. Whoo, glory! <laughs> Years ago when I, I went to Washington and held seminars, went up in the Shenandoah Valley and then spoke at the Officers Club at Fort Belvoir to 400 marvelous people. And while I went with such fear and trembling, I thought, Washington, dear God, what will I do in Washington? <laughs> You know, I thought those people would swallow me up. And I, oh, I said, I went in, went, and I was in the Hyatt Regency downtown, and I always look out over a city when I'm in a town, and I say, Father, what would you say concerning this city? And God usually gives me a word or a vision. And as I looked out that night, as I stood and looked out my window over Washington, for we were right in the heart of the government circle, I looked out over this, and do you know what God showed me? I suddenly saw a giant cobra coiled in that square, government square. And God said to me, this giant cobra, what does the cobra do, he said? He said, it charms its victims before it strikes them with that fatal poison. And he said, many are the innocents who come into this seat of government where Satan loves to see himself in government for headquarters. And he said, they come in with all good intentions, innocent of all of this, but he said, there is something about it. The more they stay here and the more they get into all of this web, he said suddenly they are charmed and the fatal sting is injected and they change. Hallelujah. I said, God, what do you intend to do about this? And he said, wait, I will tell you. We went on to the Shenandoah Valley, and the last day of the seminar there, a mighty move of God fell on the place. The Spirit of God began again to speak concerning Washington and showed me another vision in the place of the cobra. <laughs> Hallelujah! I saw the Master. He was walking the steps up to those government buildings, and he said, Before my great return, in the Lamastia again, I'm going to visit this place one more time. Hallelujah. And do you know that he even prophesied that Ramastan and Dia Brahana, before Anastai, before the coming of the Lord, he would fill that White House with a spiritual president? We're going to have it. Hallelujah. <laughs> This man will be favorable 
people, you see. God gave, you see, when Joseph went into Egypt, God gave him favor with whom? Powers. Leadership. They honored this man. And because of that, you see, Egypt was blessed, even the house of Potiphar. When one man of God gets into a certain place, if he's the right kind of a man, God will give favor to that place because of his presence there. So he's going to give favor to the churches. You wonder how we're going to get the gospel out. Well, this is how it's coming. Hallelujah. Woo-hoo. Glory. Get your eyes off of just your little place. You get your eyes on the prophetic vision of God. And that word you that we quote so much, where there's no vision, the people perish. That doesn't mean just you getting a vision to do something. No. That word meant where God does not speak to you in prophetic word, you lose your way. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ah, oh my dear, I'm going so far out here today, I didn't plan to go this way. <laughs> but you see, this is how it's going to work. You want to know how? <laughs> when uh, I was just an honored guest in the Davidic praise celebration, and uh, in this, he told of the state of Alabama who had signed a proclamation to give favor to Israel. You know, they're battling over whether to make her uh, recognized in their capital, as uh, Jerusalem and so on and so forth. And of course, the United States and Israel are to be together. And as long as they stay together, we will be undefeated. Yeah. Hear it. Hallelujah. <laughs> For I had an old German man who was one of the finest teachers of prophecy. I sat under him years ago. Been in this 51 years. I'm 75. I know I've heard a few. <laughs> Thank God for every one of them. The son of Mania, but he told us, he said, look at the word Jerusalem. U-S-A is in the center. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ooh, glory. <laughs> And Delanista, you see, we're the chosen nation that was to take the gospel to the ends of the earth like Israel was once the chosen nation to be the evangelistic power of the world. And the Colonita and the Londonia, do you know that as long as America has this vision of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, Satan won't be able to do one thing to us. So God, we're on the way. Hallelujah. I don't be, I wouldn't doubt it a bit before even before President Reagan goes out of office. He may be filled with it. He may be now. I don't know. He has a man for her Bellingwood. Do any of you know him? <laughs> Do any of you know her Bellingwood? Used to be his attorney general when he was governor of the state of California. And Herb Ellingwood, I know him, have heard him many times. Marvelous man of God. And he would go in, he and a bunch of the secretaries and all were spirit filled. They would go in and lay their hands on Governor Reagan's chair every morning and command him to be full of the spirit. God heard those prayers. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, here it is. We'll go back. <laughs> we'll bring you back here in the lot. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Life will go right on as usual. That's what's going to throw people. That's the test. You know what the greatest test of the Christian life is? Time. Oh, my dear, I've been in it 51 years, and I can name, who I can write you a roll call of those I've known who once were mightily used of God on fire, and today you can't find them. 
When I, after all the years, I was 47 years in one church and they would come back, I caught young Mary's and all oh, my dear, many went out in the ministry. We had all kinds of things. I fed the church. We had more saved and filled spirit than they did in the church. I was a feeder to the church. And many of them would come back after all these years and they'll say, Sister Ruth, you still here? You still here? All them still there? No, I'm not in that church. That church lost the vision. Churches lose it, like individuals do. We fought for it. We pled for it. We stood for it. We prayed for it for you. God showed me the vision that he willed to fulfill in that church, but they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't. So finally the day came after 20 years in intercession. God said to me, I said, Father, what do I do? He said, you're going. I'd always stayed. God said, coward run when the going gets rough, but I stayed through all those years. Fought for it. My children grew up in it. Marilyn never knew another church. She grew up there. <laughs> But finally he said, you're going, I'm going to give you now to the other parts of the body. I'm going to give the information, what you've gotten and gained all these years of speaking my faith. I'm going to give you to the other parts of the body to bless them now. This church, you're leaving. I left. The church has died. Not because I left there, don't misunderstand me, I wasn't the one that kept them alive. But they had so many beautiful opportunities of ministries that came in to revive them in the midst of the years, but they refused them. So God said, go. And many, many, many of the great intercessors, the ones who had really prayed for the church, left. They're gone. They don't even have an intercessory group anymore. And it's the lifeline of any church. You cut this out, you will lose your momentum in God. So they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The same day. Life was going right on, you see, just as it had always been. And the same day, do you know the church in the book of Revelation that is offered the greatest reward for overcoming? This is the victory. This is the victory. Overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. I may teach you on it while I'm here. You see, the church that overcomes one thing, and it's the hardest thing to overcome of all. You know what it is? The Laodicean age. That was the age of affluence. He We used to be the poor class, so to speak. <laughs> when I came into this, I came in out of the world. I was a singer, a dancer, a peacock that had been on the stage. And I mean, I tell you, when I came into this, they trimmed your feathers. <laughs> they did. <laughs> My dear, I don't know, I tell you, it was conviction of God. There was such conviction in those days that, my dear me, I went into that place I'd never heard of Pentecost. I didn't even know such a thing existed. And it's speaking in tongues and all this thing. And my dear, when I got in that service for the first time, a lump hit me right down here, and I couldn't swallow it, I couldn't get it up, and I couldn't get it down. I thought, what in the world? I want out of here. <laughs> That's the thing you know sinners do. They run. Not because they don't know it's real, but because they know it is. I knew I'd met up with something I'd never met up with. So I said, I want out of here. And I didn't come back. They invited me, but I always had an excuse. You hear? <laughs> Not because I didn't know those people didn't have something. I knew they did. 
But I wasn't ready. I loved the world. And I said, God, I'm not ready. But you know what? The Lord didn't leave me alone. I ran as hard as I could run for one year. <laughs> and I, I had a girlfriend who was so wild. She'd come by and she'd say, let's go out over hell's half acre. And I'd say, dear God, no, you go on. I don't want to ride with you. I'd suddenly become fearful for I'd never had a fear. I just knew that if I rode with her, she'd have a wreck and we'd be killed and I wasn't ready for some reason. I didn't know why, but I knew I was ready. So I said, you go on. I'll meet you. I left them and I said, dear God, at the end of a year, they came back to me once more, one more time. I was at, in my heart, I was saying, God, have those people ask me to come once more. I was too proud to go without a master. They finally did. They said, would you? And the funny part of it was there was a morning prayer meeting. I had never been to a prayer meeting in my life. <laughs> and they said, would you like to go to the morning meeting? And I said, I'll think about it. I was so independent. I went in the back room and turned around and thought about it twice. And I was already asking God to have him ask me, but I didn't want them to know it. So I turned around and two times and came back out and said, well, I think I'll go. I went. That was the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> but I did do something that I'll warn you about. Don't sit on the back seat. You know what they say? It's better to be discovered on the front than uncovered on the back. Get up on the front. They won't know you. They won't spot you so well. <laughs> you blend in a little better. <laughs> so I was on the back. Sitting back there. Oh, my dear. There were two women evangelists. And I mean, those women were on fire for God. One of them was a singer, and I mean that woman walked that platform under the mighty anointing of the Spirit of God until I tell you I was a girl of the world and had sung myself. They had claimed me a child prodigy of song, that they felt I'd even go on to high things in singing. But do you know, I tell you, I'd never heard a thing like that. Music has always had a keynote in my heart. I love it. God took me from the solo part, but he let me sing through. <laughs> Hallelujah. So they promised you, and they love the so finally they promised me as a service came to me. I rushed on the hunters, here come a height. And I, Dorita, and they came back to me, and they said, wouldn't you love to know Jesus? And I tell you, the floodgates of my soul opened. I wept. But do you know what I did? I was so proud that I'd take out my compact and clean my face and powder it and fix it up and start all over. <laughs> I said, I know they'd never had one like me. <laughs> but they bore with me <laughs> and loved me. Eventually, I got past that. And they said, receive the Holy Spirit. I thought, dear me, God, whatever it is, I don't know, but I've got to have it. Let me have it, Jesus. I've got to have it to give up the world and go through with you. Do you know in five minutes' time when I said that, I was gloriously filled with the Spirit, never heard of it in my life, and it rolled out of me like water out of a pipeline. And I mean for three weeks it didn't stop. You talk about being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I never wanted to dance. And I said, I'll be in that mad world till I'm 90. Nobody's going to stop me. God stops me. And he, the funny part of it is he doesn't even let me do a lot of dancing in the spirit. He said, you've had enough and you loved it too much. Only when I select you, will you do any dancing in the spirit? And you know when he did let me dance in the spirit? I spun like a top on one leg. <laughs> I always loved grace and beauty. And oh dear, he just let me spin like an old top. <laughs> but I went around so fast you couldn't have done it in the night. That was more, meant more to me and made me to know it was more supernatural than all of this. So I received that beautiful, marvelous experience in God. And I'm going to stop.
after 12 o'clock, and I've just begun the real head tonight to work on it. But I just want to tell you this before I make a call this morning about the beautiful spirit of the living God. You see, it isn't any new thing. Being here teaching is either out of the devil or it's a new thing. Not at all. It is that which we lost in the fall. When Adam was first created, you see, and every faculty and function was under divine control, which is good government. Divine control, and until everything in the universe is brought back under divine control, there will never be good government. But when the Deuromastanania, you see, the Deuromastai, the Diplomacia, the Demande, the Demahondai, the Demand, you see, will never exceed the supply and good government in Jesus. We will see how it should have operated before sin messed it all up. The demand before sin, there was the Yudavasana, the Demaha. It never exceeded the supply. You don't know Sunday here, Tomahoe. You see, it was all profit and no loss at all. And if we today could learn how to let the beautiful, divinity, Holy Spirit of God, He's the most intellectual, the Marita, the most knowledgeable, the wisest of all Pavanista, Elonista, and Ohoye, and we would know well how to handle any given situation. We can render decisions. We could know Amista. We could bring on an almost normal situation. We would be capable of straightening them out. Um. For you see, in Omaha, every faculty and function operating under the divine control of the Holy Spirit, when he moved in to that beautiful masterpiece, that sculptor masterpiece that he had formed, he moved into it by his divine life. It breathed into that sculptor masterpiece. And when it did... Those men of Easter, I often tell people, look at the likeness of Winston Churchill, a beautiful likeness, but he can't talk. He can't move. He can no longer give his orders to those troops in London. He can no longer inspire them. He's there in a sculptured masterpiece and likeness of him, but there's no life. When life who only come a here, God is. Moved into that masterpiece. Those eyes opened. Hallelujah. Light opened those eyes. The ears began to pick up sounds. And the first sound those ears heard was this. As the voice, the spirit seated himself at the organ of speech, which your voice is. God built the first organ. Hallelujah seated himself at that organ and began to play a masterpiece. And if you could have heard the human voice before sin brought in all those minor keys and girls and all of this business, you would not know it. It was like me. That's the one of my key stuff. How beautiful. And so he began, Adam began as the Spirit of God, seated himself at that organ with no resistance in him. You see, sin makes us resistant to God. We fight. When there is no sin, there is no resistance. The less of sin there is in you, the less of resistance you will have to God and to his nature. Can I stop? He so resisted, so there was no resistance in him. And he spoke as the Spirit of God gave him utterance. You see, the instrument doesn't know the music. The artist knows the music. Hallelujah. 
So the beautiful masterpiece of God, which we are, and we, by the Holy Spirit, in the Robothia, in the new church, which is his body, he again enters that body as he did, and he again seated himself at that organ which Satan had desecrated, and it brought this under divine, under uh, satanic control, and took it back. He did himself again. It's a new creation. He seated himself again at this beautiful organ and began to bring forth again that divine melody, that heavenly melody we call it. But it could be it, but you see, it's our most valuable weapon that we have in the arsenal of God. It's not excess value. So it's in whoever leads you to, or whatever. If you will just to Marilyn, you want to come and just read it to me something as I make a call. If you'd like more information on Billy Brim Ministries or our full line of teaching products, please call us at 1-800-972-3447 or log on to billybrim.org. If you'd like to write us, you can contact us at P.O. Box 40, Branson, Missouri, 65615, or call us at 417-336-4877.